Hey guys, had no idea what to expect. Um, I thought it'd be like 20,000 people or three, so I've got a small group so we can um, try and make it um, interactive. I've tried to use um, to make this on Prezi because I've been to a lot of conferences and sometimes you get death by PowerPoint. If this starts making your head spin and give me vertigo, just look away. It's, it's not too bad, it's, it's come a long way. So. Um, yeah, so this is a topic we're going to go through. Um, as Rob said, if there's any questions, just keep them coming. And they've told me to make it engaging, so this is about as engaging as I could make it. Hopefully, I didn't go too far. If I start going over time, because sometimes I just, you know, nut down on something for too long, just throw a shoe at me or something. Cool. So, topic I want to go through is whether project management is an art or a science, as you probably read by the um, conference um, guide. Um, a lot of you probably just knew it was a trick question and thought, hey, we know project management is both an art and a science. Right. So we're going to talk about the differences that you face dealing with projects from a scientific viewpoint versus from an arts viewpoint. Right. And I hate putting people in boxes. All right. So if you don't fit in a box, that's perfectly okay. You're normal. All right. I used to attend these sessions, psychology sessions, and um, I never seemed to fit in a box, whether you're green or red or whatever sort of flavour of the day it is. I always never fit somewhere, so I felt really really bad so you know I'll, I won't make you f feel like that today all right so I'm going to start off by just going through a quick definition about the arts and the science because when I started lecturing at uni one of the um, professors said you know if you want to get your students on board just quote the dictionary um, and apparently that means you know your shit okay so evidently I know my stuff because I've gone through the dictionary and I've actually found a definition which correlates to what I want to talk to about what an art is. Um, many different definitions. And when we think about arts projects, um, most of us don't think about a painting or a ballet or a typical arts performance, although they can be arts projects. We think about a more creative, flavoursome project where you can actually you know, add value by you know, your own design and, and intuition and innovation. Right. So arts on here was really, um, really intrigued me and they talked specifically about the arts of making friends. And this is taken from what used to be those great big books that we had in our, in our studies to show that we were educated, the Encyclopedia Britannica. So just even seeing that brought back a sense of nostalgia. Um, does anyone still have those books? No. But you remember them, right? All the leather bound, and you had to get the new updates, otherwise you were behind the times. I think the internet's killed that one. All right. Arts also... Um, for us is defined by conscious use of skill or imagination. For some people it's, it's semi-conscious and they just apply arts and end up with awesome results as a result of that. Um, if you've got the stone painter or poet inside your head or the drunk poet, you probably know where I'm going from with that one. The output of art, or how it's judged really, is, and this correlates really well with our project management definition, a project you know, delivers a unique solution. And arts are really based on excellence. Here's the output of something unique. No one's done it before. From an artist's point of view, that's, that's groundbreaking. That's excellent. Cool. And I'm sure we've used this um, excuse before in project management. Yeah. Hey, if we can get away with it, it's, it's art. Right. Cool. So in a nutshell, that's art. Um, the flip side of the coin is, is the science. All right. And who here comes from a scientific background? One person, two people, great, okay. I can relate to a small percentage of the room. The rest can throw things at me. I actually started life as, as an applied chemist, so down a very scientific pathway. And um, so I know this one quite well. I can deal with that one. And for me, it was, it was really hard going to projects where anything was okay. I had one project, it was a, um, and I wasn't working in HR, but it was a HR-driven initiative. And I rocked up to the director and said, hey, you know, what's my role in this project? It was quite a high up position in government. I said, what am I supposed to do? You give me lots of coin, you expect me to do something, right? Oh, just, just do whatever. No, you're shitting me. What do you actually expect me to do? What am I supposed to do here? What are my KPIs? You know, what, what, what do you going to fire me on if I don't do? And I shit you not, my KPI was to make people happy. As no, one's, no one was complaining about it. The project was a success. Right. Easiest thing to do, but in my head, I couldn't quantify that as being a job. Right. So apologies to anyone who's sitting there and that's their current KPIs. All right. I felt guilty going to work. So science and the definition I grew up understanding um, 
was really a, a set of processes which are prescribed, which are tried, which are tested, which are proven. And, and it's a very diplomatic approach. All right? so this is purely the science side of things. Right? Um, we'll go through something called the scientific method and scientific theory in a second, but basically this is how I guess the project management institutes try and drive projects. If you, everyone's probably read PMBOK or like to use that word. If you look at PMBOK, I guess you put on your scientific hat on, you look at the drawings, you look at the, the technical way in which it's written, and it's very much takes you down a very technical and science pathway. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of short videos um, because I thought it would make it more interesting than listening to me all day long. This one is, is just an example. I love the Big Bang Theory. I'm sure people can relate to this one. This one's good because the initial definition of, of, of art was the art of making friends. It actually specified that. So I thought, let's try and fight that, and let's see if we can apply a science-based approach to making friends. So this is the application of, um, of science to a very arts-based process, which was making friends. <laughs> cool. So science really is explained through, as I said before, systematic processes um, which are applied to, to design something that we know is going to work. All right? It's proven, it's tested. Um, excellence in science is if we can validate someone else's work. Um, that was me when I was doing my HR project, very much the Sheldon approach. How do I actually do this? What's the process? What's the system? What am I supposed to do? All right? And for a lot of people coming from a technical background, it's actually quite hard to do. You know? I've succeeded in making friends. I've got three friends that I know of, so I'm okay with that. Um, I think you can probably re relate that to a lot of project managers that, that you might work with. You don't have to name names or anything, but just keep it inside your head. Scientific theory. Does anyone know scientific theory? Know the basis of it, want to explain it? You do. Yeah, or theory? Either or. Go with what you know. I'm trying to be engaging. There's no wrong answer here. No, there is. It's the science side. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. All right. Damn it, now I can't make stuff up. Do you want to go to the other session? <laughs> Right, scientific theory is actually quite interesting. It, it works on a hypothesis, which is a theory of belief. Um, in science, you can never conclusively prove anything. Right? That's why this picture is so funny out there. Everything's always a theory, no matter how awesome this theory is. So the theory that the, the Earth is, is round, it's still a theory. We all know it to be round, but all it takes is one action to disprove that theory. That makes that theory now void. All right. And, and this is a big one. I talk about this when we talk about strategic marketing. A lot of companies spend billions and billion dollars on advertising to make people believe a certain thing. The premise of this is based on scientific theory. We'll keep supporting our theory, reinforcing our, our theory, our brand on, on people. But it just takes one action to disprove that for people to go, hang on, that theory is crap. That doesn't fly anymore. A um, noble example is the um, Gulf of Mexico with with BP, I'm sure you can relate back to that. They'd spent so much money from the 70s, the 80s, about being the green um, petroleum company, an oxymoron itself, but as soon as that happened, you could not associate BP with clean energy uh, because that one instance. And that's important for us when we're running projects because it just takes one instance, or I call it the Muppet Factor, one person to stuff up something for the organisation or the project, and the client goes, you guys don't know what you're doing. The scrutiny goes up. And it's not, a, it's not a nice environment. Right, so now we've talked about the differences. They're not mutually exclusive, so there's a big grey area where they sort of coexist, and we'll talk about whether they coexist happily or not. But science in itself can be an art. I found this circuit board pretty cool. All right. um, the dude who drew this, artist or a scientist? Da Vinci. Yeah, both. Both equally, and this is actually recognised as one of the greatest pieces of art and you know, the forefront for, for great you know, biomechanics in, in physics and so on. So it can be both. I um, thought this was pretty cool. Science can often lay the foundations for art. So this is someone taking apart a, um, a Canon digital camera to be used in an art space environment. And when you think about a lot of our projects, we might get a cool result. But when you go back to it and trace the etymology of how we got to that, that picture, there's buttloads of science in there to get to that point. So, this will give you a little bit of vertigo. 
question. What do you guys think? Who, who thinks more of an art? Who thinks more of a science? Arts people? It's going to be a, a fun group. <laughs> science people? All right. Sorry? Nice, all right. Perfect. And uh, I actually um, did some consulting for an oil and gas client recently, and he used a similar an analogy. And he, he, for him, project management was, was building an airplane. And he goes, at the moment, we're flying the airplane and building it at the same time. You know, it's just not working. So he was talking about the importance of the concept and the planning stage. All right. From the science side of things, um, things we know. We need systems. So when we run our projects, we need systems. We need some sort of structure and order to make sure things happen. We know that if it's just us, we can wing it. And this is where intuitive project management sort of lives. It's just me. I'll do it my own way. Sweet. No issues. When we start having other people in our team all doing it their own way, things don't mesh. Right? So we take people back to a common point, which you know, we call systems. Organisations call them processes and policies. The boxes for us to play in. So we need those. Unlike my project previously, we need outcomes, we need objectives, we need to quantify that we've achieved our goal, thereby you know, signalling the completion of our project. Most of our tools, if you think about it, our schedules, our costs, even our scopes, if you go down a scope definition pathway, are based on scientific principles. Okay? We'll talk about this one later on, about decisions, but Assumably, if you're accountable for someone else's money and you've made a decision based on that, there should be some element of fact to back that up, right? Okay. Project should be controlled. So when we're actually running the project, if we don't have a framework, if we don't have a system, the byproduct is we just end up with a mess. So we know that science has a, pl a part to play in project management. And a very science-based project should run like clockwork. We should have well-defined systems, processes, it should run perfectly. Why doesn't it? People. People. Great. Jeez. And it's always the other guy. All right? it's, it's never me. It's people. It is definitely them people. So let's talk about these people. Let's talk about how people think differently, how people want to do things differently. You know, this is bad. Change in projects is bad. Hang on. If we don't have this, we don't have innovation. All right, I'm in a quandary now. So let's go through the art of project management. We need to think differently. Um, I love quoting Einstein because he knew his shit. Right? Um, and he said, if we apply the same way of thinking, if we continue to apply the same way of thinking effectively, paraphrasing, we'll get nowhere. Right? We can't solve the problems using yesterday's thinking. So we need new ways of thinking, new solutions, new ways of reaching those endpoints. Stuff happens to our project where you know, we're not a closed system, we're not living in a bubble. We're going to get affected. We need a degree of flexibility. And I think this is a lot of where a lot of science-based approach, a lot of rigid frameworks become unstuck. You can't account for every permutation, every variable. So you need to have that degree of flexibility. This is my pun. I've recently become a dad, so I've been using a lot of dad jokes, and I apologise. But this is my tree, which is three. Um, it was funny inside my head. Um, in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have used it now. Um, but projects need to be looked at from all angles. It can't just be a linear approach to, to project management. Number four, um, people. People are going to follow us as project managers. We need to lead them. We need to inspire them. We can't do that by saying, look, just follow this framework, and if you step out of line, I'll kick you back in. Right. Although in some industries, that is seriously how things work. And you said it quite right when you said, look, we've got people involved. Right. And my number one rule for people and people management is that people never follow the script. So if you just ingrain that in your head, it solves a lot of problems. Right, so for that reason, running an arts project can actually be, from an artist's point of view, can actually be a little bit different. So I'm going to do a bit of a, um, bit of a technology test here and see how, how well it works. So you can take out your phones, and um, this could backfire because it could overload the, um, the little quiz I made. And this is something for you to take away inside your own head. Um, which is louder, the artist inside you or the scientist inside you? And 
If you go to this website, www.scope.training backslash quiz, I tried to make it as easy as possible. You can do this now in real time, then you get your results and you can relate to one side of the, um, the debate. Um, or you can even change sides in the room if you find yourself outnumbered. It's, a, um, it's just a, a quick question and answer. It's 10 questions, which will give you a, a result as to your approach in project management. management, whether you're more of an arts kid or a science-based. I've tested it with two people running the quiz concurrently and it hasn't crashed, so, you know. <laughs> we could break it, though. So there's no, not, there's no dot .coms, no dot .au's. I don't know how they've done this, but it's pretty cool. Are you a winner? Oh, my God, I tried so hard to get that one. <laughs> I tried every time. I tried about six times to try and get that one. That is the winning one. Damn it. You're just saying that. Seriously sat there a couple of times like, I'm going to try and get this one. And for me, I kept going down and I was an arts bias project manager each time. And I tried to fight it. The scientist in me said, no, you, you can't leave with that. And I gave up after a while. But, gee, that's, congratulations. Very uh, pure artist or artist biased? Artist biased. Nice. So I'll just explain um, the different rankings of how, how it works. And you know, there's, there's no wrong answer here, right? It sort of works on this spectrum of... Um, you can live somewhere here, so your balance PM lives in the middle. And usually the balance project manager has the ability to see both angles, right? understands the scientific rationale and the need for that, but also understands the importance of people and, and the need for sometimes to deviate from that structure. Okay? On this end, you can have what's called a pure artist. It doesn't mean that you like fancy drawings and so on. It, it just means that your approach is more suited to the art side of project management. And very much that way. And some of the deficiencies may be understanding people in this very distant land over there who are called pure scientists. And in the middle is where most people live. So if you think about two bell curves, the majority of people are going to live in either one of those little areas. And hopefully that reflects what we've gone through. Do you want to get any of the extremes of pure art or pure science? Fight it. <laughs> I'm an applied chemist. So I was getting arts bias, arts bias, and I was like, no, no. Do you often, do you often have frustrations at work with your systems and your processes? <laughs> there it is. And one of, the, um, one of the great civil engineers case studies is a, um, the bridge they built. And there were, I think it was Canada in the US. One was using metric, one was using imperial. And they, they designed this bridge to meet in the middle. And it all cocked up because the measurements were out. Um, so that's, two, that's an example of two different people winging it at the same time, hoping to meet somewhere which you know, hadn't been defined properly. All right. Anyone else shocked by this? No, they're happy with their results. Yeah. Hey, I, I seriously fought mine five times. I was like, no, I'm not going to be an arts bias project manager. I'm just not. And I kept going back to that. All right, so knowing what we know, a lot of this stuff can be traced by where we come from. Um, and there's this big debate in project management, as you know. Um, what, who works better, an art, a technical project manager or a project manager project manager? Right. There's no right answer for this. Where I used to work in construction, if you didn't have a construction background, you were useless. You weren't a project manager. You couldn't call yourself a project manager. In other areas, not having a technical background is, is seen as an asset because you have the tendency to micromanage less and so on. All right? So there's pros and cons of both models. So a bit of a who am I sort of thing. Where did I come from? You can do a show of hands, or if you're reluctant to do so, just keep it inside. Um, were you? A technical expert before becoming a pro. This is the assumption that we are project managers at this point. Well, you, did you come from a technical background? A lot of engineers, yeah, came from technical background. So the majority of us came from technical background. Most of you did that. Did you score down the science pathway? Arts people. That's good. Bit of a mix. 
there's a tendency that most technical experts come from, from a science approach because they know the stuff, they know the process, they know how it's done. They're often better than the people they're managing. Did you come from a generic management position, then yeah, migrate into PM? Okay. And managers are normally good at dealing with people. Right? We understand people. We, we, we can motivate them. We understand how all these things work. So generally, there's a tendency that these people come from more of an arts-based um, background environment, and they become the artists on the test. Or did you come from neither, and you're just a person who got thrown into a project? And this is me in one of my roles. I um, first project I did was an IT project, and um, it was an EOI, and I didn't want to apply for it. My boss said, "Just apply for it. It'd be a really good opportunity." Bang, bang, bang. And I was at uni at the same time, and I thought, oh, "Give it a shot. See what happens." Um, so I put the EOI in, and um, well, my manager put it on my behalf. He sent an email saying, "Yep, yeah, Nick wants to do this." I think he's trying to get rid of me, you know, the special projects. Um, anyway, the interview, they're like, so what do you know about IT? Nothing. I can operate a PC, except for Windows 8. I don't think anyone can operate that. Um, but I was like, look, nothing. I'm not an IT person. I know nothing about networking and so on. OK. So what do you know about project management? Nothing. Nothing. I've heard the word. It sounds pretty sexy. And back then, it wasn't used as, as cavalierly as it was now. It, it meant something. All right. um, okay, how's this going to go? Okay, I think I've bummed out on that interview. The two key questions I asked, I knew nothing about it. Somehow I still got that job. I went to uni after school and I learned project management by doing the masters, which was like really validating stuff I already knew. Okay, and for me, I sort of paraphrase um, project management with common sense. Right. Then you learn that common sense isn't that common and some people struggle at it. So a lot of times where we come from actually directs the type of project manager we're going to be. And that's important to understand because a lot of people on your project teams may come from different areas. This is a good thing. We talk about conflict sessions quite a lot um, in project management. Conflict is, is awesome. Conflict gives us that friction that actually makes us engineer solutions and different ideas. I'm not talking about the conflict that results in physical altercations, obviously, but conflict can be productive. And if you understand where people are coming from, you can actually reach some sort of maturity with that. So just as a bit of generality, people from the technical background generally tend to focus the science base. They tend to control the detail because if you look at the articulation pathways in organisations, you get promoted as, as a PM based on your excellence in technical discipline. Hey, go manage people. You shortly realise it's a different skill set required. You're managing budgets and schedules, not the technical aspects. So you go back to what you're awesome at. Hey, look, I'll, I'll, I'll do that for you. I'll, I'll do those calculations for you. You just go and, um, go and make some coffee. Okay? And obviously, your new pay packet doesn't warrant you being the technical person anymore, so management has issues with that. From the um, non-technical side, you tend to prefer, um, <coughs> and I hate putting people in boxes because there are people who sit away, um, you tend to focus on the art side of things and prefer that, the creativity, because you don't know the way it's been done for 20 years. You know how to manage project, and a large part of project is coming with the concept phase. You get one shot to, do, to make your mark in this industry. Let's not do it the same as it's been done. Let's do it differently. Right? So non-technical PMs tend to approach that. And you tend to consult people a lot more, which is, I think, a, a very valid point of, of being a non-technical project manager. They tend to have a greater consultancy because they don't know. They don't know the, the implicit details. So let's ask people that that do. It leads to empowerment and all that cool stuff that comes along with it. So our background can affect where we, how we actually um, run our projects. All right. Any questions? <coughs> what influences our decision making? Um, I've looked at a couple of things, um, whether it's a very science and very evidence-based to support our decisions, or is it more a wimp? Let's roll with that. Um, now, this research, and feel free to, to pull holes in it if you want, it actually got disproved by a university in Utah about two years ago. Um, but a lot of companies have made their bread and butter on this. And the, um, the thing behind it is they went through and they studied stroke victims. And they found in stroke victims that, because in stroke you lose one of the hemispheres in your brains, they found that stroke victims um, who lost a certain hemisphere, the right or the left, 
tend to lose out or weren't so good at certain cognitive skills, languages, dealing with social interaction and so on. So they tend to isolate those to a certain hemisphere. What the newer study pointed to was that we've actually got neurons that connect everything, so it's not just isolated to one hemisphere. Right? So there isn't that dominance. But um, it's a lot sexier saying that you're a right brain or a left brain person. Right? But, and it still points, um, paints the picture quite clearly. So the right brain is usually what we associate with the arts, with the creative side of, of, of your brain. And that's where all your languages and your social skills, apart from this new study, scientific theory, hey, it's disproved now. One person said, hey, this isn't right, um, live. So if you're an artist, PM, you tend to use that. The association is you tend to use the right brain. If you're the science side, again, the tendency is you tend to focus on the other side of your brain, left brain thinking, as it's um, often known. That thing just scares me, but um, it looked pretty cool. So, the bulk of us have the ability to get these hemispheres to talk to each other, and that's where the connections come in really handy. And most of the times, our decision is, is influenced by, by both factors. The science, the facts, the evidence, has it been done before, is it going to work technically? And then our gut. Hey, what do you reckon? Yeah, that sounds good, let's roll with it. Okay. Um, some people use their gut, think a lot more than others. Others rely purely on facts to make decisions, and sometimes that can delay things. So, how do we balance these guys? And and what is what is better? Is it better to use the brain or, or the gut? I've got one little um, video here, but before I I click on this one, um, put your hand up if this is you. So this should be everyone, right? At some point, we've made a decision without all the facts. We've sort of gone through and go, look, a project, by definition, is a unique endeavor. Unique, function of information, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. Okay, So at some point, we've done that. So we all are guilty of doing this. When you're accountable for other people's money, your clients' money, your stakeholders, your companies, we need a bit more of a rational brain input. Okay? <coughs> Unless it works out well, and then it's OK. No one asks questions. I like how you got away with um, going to George and say, hey, you know, we, we all think from the gut. <laughs> I mean, he's, George Bush is one of the most astute scientific minds that I know of. That's why I thought this video worked really well. But sometimes we do need to make those decisions from the gut. That was sarcasm, okay? So, <laughs> sorry for the science guys who are going, oh my God, <laughs> this guy's a Muppet. He actually believes that. All right, sometimes we do need to make those decisions, but... <clears throat> I've got one that sort of looks at both things, and this will take us back a bit. Who's played with this? Who's ever tried to solve this or hold it? Okay, everyone, this is good. Who's actually succeeded at solving this? <laughs> Was it a 12-year-old on YouTube from America then? Okay, so you need to put this one. Okay, slow down, slow down. There are methods. Has anyone else solved it apart from this gentleman? Yeah, I was the same as you. Cool, I've got the instructions. I'm going to look like a genius. So, okay, I'm bored. <laughs> nice. And you know what? When I was Googling a picture for this, you can buy stickers from eBay. <laughs> you can actually buy Ruby's Cube stickers. Um, that would have been a hit back in the 80s. I don't know, when this bad boy came about. Think of this as your, um, your project, right? We can take two options to it, two solutions, two methods to try and solve it. Everyone who put their hand up saying, hey, we tried to solve it, most people said, by gut feel. We thought we'd look at it, hey, this isn't too tough. We can do this project, let's go, okay? People who said, slow down, we can download some processes, we can download some solutions, went and got something like this. And this is our, our very technically run project. Let's stop, let's make a detailed project plan that any Muppet, aside from me, I'm throwing you in, in, in the basket with me, <laughs> can, can follow, all right? Easy, cool. All right, so some projects do require that scientific approach. I'm sure you could take the arts approach, and this is a nice arts picture, so think about that. We can take the, the nice arts approach and try and solve the Rubik's Cube. Where does that get us, though? There, right there. That's a single place. Frustration, 
we take it apart, we break it, we don't usually achieve the outcome, right? Because it's, it's way too technical. A lot of times we approach decision-making the same way. Oh, that's easy, let's go and do that. And think about it next time you do that decision. If I had a Rubik's Cube, would this fly? Or should I actually get a bit more information and have a bit more of that science hat on to try and solve this problem? And this is where the technical and the non-technical people tend to argue. Right? Technical people as well, if you had two technical people all working in their own way trying to solve the Rubik's Cube, so let's say you and your brother, you do a, you have a turn, then your brother does a turn, no matter if you're both geniuses, you're probably going to struggle unless you're using the same internet cheat sheets. So when we talk about project conformity and consistency, that's what we usually allude to. I applied this to one of the very common project management tasks and approaches, um, making a schedule. All a schedule is, is is a blueprint of how we're going to coordinate our activities, a timeline when things are going to get done, etc. So you know what a schedule is. Scientific approach. First thing we do, we go through and we get all the information. All right, we get all the data we can, past projects, reference class forecasting, anything, all the scientific methods that we know of, we get everything. We're recording all the information. Cool. We've got everything. And this can take a while because we're getting everything. Then we'll say, okay, well, that was done back then. This is now. Let's make a few little curves and change things around to make this relevant to our project. Cool. Project uniques. Sometimes they can be challenging. Then we'll use some sort of software program. I don't know what you guys are using. MS Projects Convention or P6, and we'll try and make a pretty picture. Cool, done. Once we've done that, it looks cool. We've got Gantt charts, all right? We've got s curves We play around with costs and everything. This is awesome. We've got the power of the pretty pictures behind us to say, here is the schedule. No one's going to refute that because it's got boxes and arrows, right? And you can't fight boxes and arrows. Right? Write that down. You can't fight boxes and arrows. Then our schedule is complete. Cool. If we took that from a, um, from a different point of view, an art standpoint, we would um, go to the client and say, hey, when does this need to be done? Steve, when do you need this done by? Yesterday. All right, so I'll get the scientists to invent the time machine because I can't do that. So we'll ask the, the, the client, when does it need to be done? No worries, we'll make that happen because we're in the business of pleasing people. And then our schedule's done, right? So this is a lot quicker. And sometimes we approach projects with this nonchalant. And the scientists probably call that a top-down estimation, right? Okay. Go to the client, when do you want it done? Yep, yeah, cool, we can do that. If you think about budgets, how your last project was budgeted, it was probably done in a similar fashion. Yeah, look, we've got this much money to spend. And then the scope got embellished based on that to try and take up the budget. So it's not totally ridiculous. So throw it out there. Which approach would have the greatest chance of success?